I want to just ask that we uh, we stay in kind of a season of prayer just for another minute. Um, if you this morning have a special need, a special prayer need, I just want to encourage you to go to one of the one of the corners, and um, our elders uh, will will watch and uh, and come and pray with you. If you have a special need this morning, I'm aware of some, and and I want to lift those up. But if you have a special need this morning. Um, Sally and Kelly and Yoli and Dave and, and Steve will be watching and, and uh, come and join you where you are. If you need a, a special time of prayer this morning, I'm just to encourage you to go while we're praying uh, corporately. God, I do thank you so much for, uh, for the beautiful, beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for uh, the gift of worship and the anointing that you've put on Joseph and, um, and our service this morning. And all the glory and credit goes to you, God, because you are the only one worthy of glory. You're the only one worthy of credit. And we thank you. And God, we, I know that there's some things you've laid on my heart that we need to pray for today as a, as a corporate body. And so I just want to lift those things up. God, I know that there are families in the church um, who are making tough decisions right now about the future, about school, about careers, about other things. And God, Holy Spirit, you know the answer. You not only know the answer, but you know how you want us to pray. And so we come in agreement with you um, that your perfect will would be done. Your will that comes from a father's heart, that is a heart of love and compassion and mercy and grace. And a God who is a provider above all other prov providers. And uh, God, we just thank you in advance for what we're going to see happen in these families' lives. God, I know that there are people who are in transition right now who are looking for a place to live, uh, looking for a new career, uh, looking for your open door. And God, I pray that you would make that open door very obvious and that you would do it in, in your time, but that we would, we would be on your time so that it would we would know that it's right on time. And God, that we would be comforted, that we would not be in a hurry, that we would not worry, that we would have absolutely no faith in the enemy, and all of our faith would be in our Father, who is in heaven, who gives us every good and perfect gift. And God, I know of at least one person, Virginia, as she gets ready to go to school and and going to be moving away from us. And I told her this morning, I'm happy for her. I'm not happy for us because we love her. And there are other people, uh, Joseph and other people who are getting ready, Matt, who are getting ready to, to start school. And it's going to be new. It's going to be different. And God, we know that you've already gone before them. You have prepared the way. And we do pray that they would be the head and not the tail, that they would be blessed as they go in and as they come out. And that at all times and in all things, they would, they would exemplify the person of Jesus Christ in what they do, and that they would grow in favor in, the stat, in stature in the sight of men and of you, Lord. And then, God, I pray for this week, um, the Voice of the Apostle Conference that begins tomorrow evening, and, and several of us are already committed to go. And, 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 and God, I, I have no idea what you're going to do for us this week, and I'm excited about it. God, the fact that there are going to be four or 5,000 people crowded in Nashville down in the Music City Center with just, just the heart for you, that's exciting. That's powerful. And God, I thank you for that. And I pray, Father, that your will there would be done, uh, that you would organize everything so that we would get the most out of it. Thank you, God, for answered prayers. Thank you, God, for those times when your answer is no, even though that's not what we want, but that is what you want for us because you want, what, you want the best for us. You do not want second best. You do not want worst. You always want best. And so we thank you, God, that even when we pray, you still love us through the no. You still love us through the wait, and you still love us through the yes. And so, God, we just pray that you will continue to move in our service today. And now, Holy Spirit, I want to ask, you are the teacher here. You are the instructor here. You are the guide here. You are the one who is setting the pace in this service. And I ask that right now, Holy Spirit, 
you would lay on every person's heart in here, in their mind, that they would know what it is you want to tell them today. That already you would say to them, hey, this is what, this is what I want you to look for today. Maybe it's going to be a word. Maybe it's going to be an image. Maybe it's going to be a picture. Maybe it's going to be a thought. Maybe it's going to be a feeling. Holy Spirit, I don't know what everybody in here needs, but you do, and you are the one who meets our needs. So Holy Spirit, right now, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would lay on each of our hearts and our minds what it is you have for us today. We thank you. We honor you. We love you. And now we worship you through opening your word, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we uh, get too far into the message, I want to give you a great update on uh, Oaks. Um, For those of you who don't know, Oaks got to come home Wednesday. Yes, he was born on Wednesday. He got to come home the following Wednesday. Uh, the one thing as we left the hospital uh, that we were, we were uh, still in, in believing for but hadn't seen yet was uh, his bladder and kidneys. And so they sent him home. Uh, they sent Sarah and Keenan home with the instructions to, to do a catheter with him every four hours, which as a new parent is the last thing you want to have to do. But um, I want to brag on Keenan. Um, he, was, uh, he changed every diaper he did that. He he was uh, he was incredible. He's he already is an incredible father, and of course, Sarah's been an incredible mother since she was about four. So, um, so but anyways, so we were uh, one of the urologists, and I understand we have several doctors here. I love doctors. I love doctors. Some doctors speak hope. Some doctors speak well. Worst case scenario. The urologist kind of was worst case scenario kind of guy, and he was like, well, you may as well get used to this because you're going to be doing this the rest of his life. And we just said, you know, that's not what we're hearing. And uh, I actually, um, I actually, in my prayer over Oaks, that at some point he have an opportunity to demonstrate his ability to pee with this particular (laughs) urologist. And everybody had scriptures. They were praying over him. I kept singing, let the rivers flow. I just thought that would be good. And uh, yesterday when we were there, the last three casts that they had done, uh, when, when he left, he, they were in the 60s, 50s and 60s. They said they'd be happy if they were in the 25s. Yesterday, he had three in a row that were 9, 7, and that was Friday? Yeah, Friday, Friday, 9, 7, and 0, which are way less than 50 and 60. And I think in the last 36 hours, nothing has been over a teen. Um, so we're excited about that. They're going to get to see, uh, you know, it's an ongoing process with getting them to release them and, and all that. So it's, thank you, and um, they, uh, they will eventually be ready for, uh, for, for company. Right now they're sleeping around his four-hour schedule, so you understand that. But, uh, but I, got to, uh, I got to see him. Graham finally got to hold him and smell him and all that other good stuff the other day. And and uh, so thank you for your prayers. Um, so that's, that's my report about that. So you're all ready to go into John chapter 1, verse 15 through 34. That's where we're going to be today. And I want to start the story today with, uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about my dad. Uh, my mom and dad, especially my mom, watches the videos. So I have to, you know, make sure I don't say anything that would get me in trouble. Um, but I'm gonna, I want to talk about my dad. Um, my dad is obviously the one on your right, the one with, that kind of looks like a salty sailor. And um, I, I know the lighting is a little bit weird, but um, the next slide kind of shows you something. You see what's in his pocket? I know it's hard to see, but that's a pen, a pencil, and a flashlight. My dad does not go anywhere without a flashlight. You ask Why? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I worked that into my sermon. Um, My dad, uh, years ago, the church that I grew up in was North Pompano Baptist Church there in Pompano Beach. Uh, It is now, I think, a Haitian church, so that's kind of cool. It was a beautiful, the the, the sanctuary was, uh, you know, tall like this. Uh, There was a balcony. In the back of the balcony was was the sound booth. And in the top of the sound booth, in the ceiling, 
was an attic cover. You slid that attic cover out of the way, and then you could use a ladder to get up in there into the attic, and that was where some of the electrical stuff was. My dad is an electrician, and he, he was always the guy who, whenever something broke at the church, we'll call Art, he'll know how to fix it. And so uh, he goes over there one night uh, after work, and he goes in, and of course, he turns on the light in the hallway, he turns on the light in the sanctuary, he turns on the light in the staircase, he turns the light on the balcony, he turns the light on in the, in the, uh, in the sound booth. Um, he gets his ladder in the place, he climbs up the ladder, he slides the cover out of the way, he gets up in there, he turns the light on in the attic. Everything is awesome and he's working along and then the power went out. So now he said, I am looking for a hole in the floor to climb down on a ladder I cannot see, to go into a sound booth that I'm not that familiar with, to then get into the balcony, to then work down the staircase so that I can get back to where I'm at least familiar with everything. That was the last time my dad ever went anywhere without a flashlight. The reason he didn't have a flashlight when he went into that building is, guess what? He had no intentions of going into the dark place the dark place came into where he was. Now, how many of us Christians spend a lot of time avoiding the dark place? See, I, it hit me, and this is completely Holy Spirit, this is not me. It hit me the other day. We spend a lot of time and energy avoiding the very place we were designed to go. You were given the light so that you could go into the dark places because the dark place is going to stay dark until we take the light into it. We are light carriers, and there's no reason to have a flashlight if you never anticipate going into the dark. As a matter of fact, you ought to plan on going into the dark. If you are the type of person, though, that you say, but when I go into dark places, it tends to make me be dark, then let me suggest to you, you may not be carrying a flashlight, you may be carrying a mirror. That when you're in church around a lot of other lights, you've got a light. But when you're in the dark around a lot of other dark you don't have a light. You just have a mirror. You're just reflecting the fellowship that you're in. Church, Jesus came to be the light in the darkness, and he told us that you and I are to be salt and light. So, so are you saying we're supposed to take regular field trips into the dark? I think so. I think we are. I think that's the reason he's given us a flashlight. Today at 2 o'clock, uh, many of y'all know this, and if you don't, I'm going to go ahead and just share it with you. Um, Sally and, and Sarah and Leah really are, have been extra burdened about uh, all the stuff that's been going on with the abortion and Planned Parenthood and, and all that stuff, and there are, there are, there are small grassroots or movements that are coming up. And today at 2 o'clock, Sally, hold your hands up, Emma, um, me, anybody who wants to join us at two o'clock, we're going to go down to the Capitol, and we're just going to have a we're just going to have a silent protest. We sent it out on Facebook. I know uh, I know Barbara was, you know, we send it out and and let's just be honest. As a Christian, I'm sitting there going, man, you know, I'm 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 really glad there's not a Titans game today at one o'clock because I would be hard pressed to figure out eh, you know which of those. Are. We're supposed to go into dark places. That is a dark place. It's a dark topic. And I know, listen, if you're sitting there going, I just don't want to be bothered by that, I understand. But me understanding doesn't make it right that you don't want to go into a dark place. I understand because I don't want to go there either. But, but we're carrying a flashlight. We're carrying a flashlight that is, that is powered off of the light of the world. We're carrying a flashlight that, you know, a minute ago, I, I never remember to put batteries in this thing. And then, and then the fact that I have it draped and I don't have it tucked down my shirt, I'm always snagging the cord and everything like that. That's not the kind of light that we carry. Something that's fragile and frail, and if we tug it the wrong way, it might come apart. You cannot pull the light of God apart. It, it doesn't. You just can't do it. And remember last week, I encouraged you to go into a dark room with a baseball bat and a flashlight. Use the baseball bat until you're tired of swinging at the dark, and then just flip on the flashlight, and the dark immediately goes away. That is what we are supposed to be in the world. So let me just encourage you. Um, if you are the light of the world, my question is, are you making a difference in a dark place? 
The dark place you may make a difference is your family. It may be your workplace. It may be your, your neighborhood. Um, I, I, I don't know, but I do know that we're here as part of the redemptive work. If God was finished with us, we'd all be in heaven right now. But because we're still here, I'm assuming he still has something for us to do. It seems like as I look through the word, God actually has a pretty, pretty good plan. And uh, so if we're still here, then we're still useful. We're still supposed to be active in pursuing the things of the Lord. And uh, so now that brings us to the person that John, the beloved disciple, the guy who authored the book of John. Remember, we talked about this a little bit last week. He was probably in, maybe in his 90s. He is the last remaining eyewitness of Jesus Christ. He's the last one. When somebody wants to know firsthand knowledge, there's only one guy left in the world that they can go to, and that is John, the beloved disciple. And uh, even though he started out as a, probably a 15-year-old boy, uh, he, was, um, he, was, they, he was one of the sons of thunder. They said that he had this big, booming voice, and I, and I, uh, I you know, I kind of got Luke to give us a, his best booming voice last week, but I've actually heard him do much more booming voice than, than what he did last week. But, but so even as a young man, he had no problem. Jesus, let us call down thunder on these Samaritans. We'll just wipe them out. So he's that kind of person. So I know, you know, we think about he was the, he was the nice, gentle guy. He also had a, hey, let's just let's just go in here and tear things up kind of attitude too. So John is talking about the first person that he ever committed himself to, the first person that he was ever a disciple to, and that is John the Baptist. Uh, I love this um, recording that I have of the scripture, and, and uh, the, you know, they always use people with British accents or something, John the Baptizer, and I always thought that was kind of cool. So I, if I say John the Baptizer, you'll know I'm just repeating something I've heard. So John the Baptist, that's who he's going to talk about, and that's really all we're going to do today, is we're just going to talk a little bit about this person, John the Baptist, because he says some things that at face value you might go, well, okay, so is he Elijah? Is he not Elijah? Is he, is he the prophet or is he not the prophet? And, and I think we're going to walk away with um, some pretty cool things. So let's go John chapter 1, verse 15. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one of whom I said, The one coming after me has surpassed me because he existed before me. Okay, so John the Baptist, or JTB as I've started calling him, John the Baptist, he's six months older than Jesus. Now, there's the, there's the question. Okay, we know when, when Mary, who just found out she's pregnant, and she goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth, who is six months pregnant with John the Baptist, and when Mary's voice is heard by the baby inside, he leaps inside Elizabeth's womb. So he knew supernaturally, spiritually, he knew as a six-month-old in womb, he knew that that brand new life was the Messiah. So, but then it's, we're going to find out, he says, well, I'm going to know for sure when I see the Holy Spirit come down and, and rest on him, then I'll know for sure. And then we know that when he was in prison, he sent word to Jesus, are you the one or is there another? So that can kind of make you think, man, did John know or did John not know? I believe John knew. I believe John was like all of us, and he had moments where he might have, he might have just need, needed to be reassured. But I think a lot of times when John is saying, are you the one or is there another, he was saying it for his disciples' benefits. He was like, okay, I can tell you, but if you hear it from him, you're more likely to follow him. Because guess what? I am not the light of the world. I'm just the one who points to the light of the world. And isn't that the job of all of us, to point to the light of the world? So John the Baptist is Jesus' superior in that culture, but he immediately says, no, no, I'm, I'm not his superior. As a matter of fact, we know that Jesus waited until he was 30 to start his ministry. We get the feeling John the Baptist started his ministry 
at about age two. You know, it's like he immediately kind of gravitated towards, uh, he, he was the only kid in preschool who was running around in, uh, in camel skin, eating locust and, and honey and going, prepare ye the way of the Lord, you know, and, and that was what he wanted to do every day at, place, at recesses. Hey, let, let me practice baptizing everybody. Come on in here. He, he seems like he was in ministry a long time. So remember, from the culture, these people who have come to talk to John the Baptist, we're going to find out, the, the, you know, who are you? If you're not the one, then who are you? They figured, well, you outrank this, this other guy, don't you? He's like, no, no. He was before me. God, what John said, in the beginning was the word. He didn't appear at the beginning. The beginning appeared so we could see that he was already there. The beginning, he was already existent. So this is John the Baptist and his, his response. Um, is there one coming that surpasses me? Verses 16 and 17. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace for his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law came to convict. The law came to point out how far we were from this holy, holy, holy God. The law cannot save us. There is no one who can live up to the law. That kind of sounds familiar, like um, we spent several months talking about Paul in Ephesians. And John the Baptist is saying the same thing. The, the, the law came from Moses, but the truth came through Jesus Christ. And, and John's John's way of thinking about it is, okay, this has happened, and now here comes Jesus. But guess what? Actually, Jesus was over here, and then the law came, and then Jesus was over here. Jesus has always been there. His redemption has always been there, but the law came at a certain point to show us how much we needed that Jesus that was there all the time. So the picture here that we have is taking holding, clinging to grace. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace. We're taking it, we're holding it, we're clinging to it. How many of y'all have ever had a moment where you just kind of cling to grace? I just, man, I don't, I don't, everything else has been out of control. I have nothing else to hold on to. I'm just going to cling to his grace. I'm going to take hold of it. I'm going to, I'm going to just wrap myself around it. I'm going to, I'm going to work for it. Jesus came to redeem. The law came to convict. While the law was from God through the writing of Moses, truth and grace appear through Jesus. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. So John the Baptist is establishing that Jesus is beyond and before. Beyond and before. He's been there the whole time, and he's beyond anything you've ever seen. And literally, when you see Jesus, you have seen God. Up to this point, nobody else has seen God. Moses got a, a view of, his, of, his, of the back of him as, as he walked away, and he had to even be protected from that. But Jesus isn't just a part of God. He is God. And if you see Jesus, you have seen God. God. Now, I th how many of y'all completely understand Father, Son, Holy Spirit? You've completely got that down, nailed down. Okay. But if you're one of those people that's like, well, there's God, and then there's this lesser thing called Jesus, and then there's this really lesser thing called the Holy Spirit. It's not that way. When you see Jesus, you see God. So it's God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. It's, it's all up there. It's all powerful. It's all full. There's not one of them that's muted over the other one. They choose to, the Holy Spirit chooses to send you to Jesus, and Jesus chooses to send you to God. I don't understand it. I just, that's the way they've got it organized, and I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. So Jesus is preexistent and was with the Father before he was here. John the Baptist was here. Verse 19 and 20. This is John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He did not refuse to answer, but he declared, I am not the Messiah. Now they came to ask him who he was, and he answered by saying who he wasn't. Now, 
for some of us, we get frustrated when people don't answer our questions or when they answer our questions with yet another question. That's not what we wanted. But, but John knew, hey, look, I'm, I don't, John, John was, I think John was saying, I don't want this at any point to become about me because it ain't about me. It is about the one who's coming. It is about the Messiah. Don't, don't, even, don't even get out your pen and start writing down my, my stats because it's not about me. It's about the one who's coming. The less you know about me, the better it is because what you want to do is save all the space on your page for who Jesus is. I really think that's John's, John's whole attitude. Um, I've got a, a friend, um, I've got to watch him kind of mature in the ministry. And the last time, a couple of times I've seen him do a funeral, I, I've, I've commented and complimented him each time. Because he's the kind of guy who keeps the funeral about the person who is dead, died, deceased, no longer there, um, the one in the casket. He, he's, he keeps it about him or her and God. And I compare him to other preachers that I've known in the past who an entire funeral sermon sounds more like this. I remember when I went and did this, and I said this to this person, and then that person said, I, 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 I. Um, uh, the, the pastor at Connell Methodist. What's his? Paul. Paul does that also. The, the, his, he's so good about He keeps the message about that person. He keeps the message about that person and the person of God. To, to me, that's just incredible. And that's what John was doing here. He was going, look, <laughs> I don't, the less you know about me, the better. I'm here to point to this person over there. I don't have to primp. I don't have to, I don't have to get my head shot just perfect. I don't have to get in the right this or that because it's not about me. All I'm doing, I'm just a road sign. I'm just pointing that way. Here he comes. That's him. Here he comes. That's him. And I'm not him. He's even going to go on to say a little bit more about that here. So, um, verse, um, verse 19, this is John's testimony. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask, Who are you? He did not refuse to answer, but he declared, I am not the Messiah. Verse 21, what then? Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Now, as I understand the scriptures, according to Jesus, he, he is Elijah. He, he is the prophet. But again, remember, it's not like he's trying to mislead or anything like that. He's just like, that's not the point. That is not the issue here. It's not about who I am. It's about who Jesus is. He, um, so, so he answers that. Why doesn't he say that? You know, I, I just think he's, his job is to point people to the Messiah. And he doesn't want to do anything to distract from that critical information. Verse 22. Let me just, let me just sidestep. I, I, I feel like the Holy Spirit. We, we know people who, min, who their ministry gets sidetracked by little side issues. They don't keep it about Jesus. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all remember Brother Glenn from First Baptist Hendersonville, but one of his favorite sayings was, keep the main thing, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And sometimes when you get off on one side or the other, and it's, well, it's going to be about this little thing, and then you become known as that guy who does this little thing over here, you've distracted from the pure gospel. The pure gospel is all about Jesus, period, end of story. So, verse 22, who are you then, they ask? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? We've got to tell them something. What can we tell them? We have to figure this out for ourselves. We have to, we have to tell people something. Why, why is it that you can stand under this pressure and do what you're doing? How is it you're able to go through that defeat and still keep a positive attitude? How is it that you're able to go through... Why is it that you have a better attitude than I do? Why, 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 why? How? We have to know something. Well, here's, here's John's answer. He said, I am a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet 
said, and I, obviously this is straight out of Isaiah chapter 40, and the prophet Isaiah here is, he's, he's, he's been talking about sin and cleansing and, and, um, and the promised freedom that's coming. And so John the Baptist has taken him all the way back to the, the prophet Isaiah, and, and yes, it was speaking specifically of somebody, but notice he says, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. I submit to you that we're all supposed to be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. We're all supposed to be the voice of one taking our flashlight out into the dark world. It wasn't just his job and nobody else's job. It's all of our, it's all of our responsibility and privilege. I'm making a straight path for the one who will set you free. You want to know who I am? I'm the guy pointing to the guy who's going to fix this. I'm the guy who's pointing to the guy who's going to fix this. That's who I am. We were sitting in a Chick-fil-A the other day, and um, I halfway took an opportunity. I, I wish I would have done a little bit more. Uh, but Jack was sitting there, Sally and I, and, and Leah, and um, I don't know who else, but Jack was sitting there. And there were four uh, Metro police officers sitting at the table next to us. And so I called Jack's attention to the police officers, and I said, those are good guys. Those are our friends. And I, I, I kind of wish now that I would have maybe done more, you know. But, but anyways, I, I wanted to establish with him that those guys are who you go to when you need help. Now, I know we can get all, what about this? And what about? For the most part, 99% of the people who are wearing blue are good people, and we need to teach our children to respect them and go to them. Uh, unlike Jeff Foxworthy said, um, Ninety percent of all lawyers give the rest of them a bad name. I, you know, it's, it's a different thing. There's no lawyers here, are there? Okay, good. Whew. Thanks. I just thought that was funny. Um, so, so here we are. I'm the guy who's pointing to the guy. I'm just one of the many who are pointing to the one of many. He is the one, capital O, capital N, capital E. Verse 24, now they had been sent from the Pharisees, so they asked him, why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? Now think about this. He has told them, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. Every time they've tried to get him to admit to some power or authority or whatever, he's just deferred to Jesus, deferred to Jesus, deferred to Jesus. They were going to attack him anyways. Well, then why are you baptizing people? If you don't have any of these positions, if he would have said, oh, I am Elijah, well, then why are you doing this? The attack, people are going to attack us because we are carrying the banner of Jesus Christ. It comes with the banner. It comes with the territory. When we are carrying the one who is the offense to many, we're going to be an offense to many. And that's okay. Again, remember, you get the flashlight in the eyes in, when you're sitting there in the dark. You're probably going to be a little irritated with that. When people have the light of Christ shown on their life, their first reaction may be anger. It may be resentment. It may be attack. So it's not surprising these guys have come from the Pharisees. Okay, then why are you baptizing if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? So verse 26 and 27, I baptize with water, John answered. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. Look, I baptize with water. But the one who's coming, <laughs> I'm, not even, I'm not even worthy to unpack his clothes. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. He's going to baptize you with something way better than water. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize you with himself. He is going to, he's, he's come from God in a form that you can see, and he's going to go from being a form you can see, touch, and feel to a form that you can literally be filled with. That, that's, so me baptizing with water, it's, it's just another way of me pointing somebody to the one who's going to baptize you with a life-changing experience with the living God. Verse 28, all this happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next few verses I'm just going to kind of go through here pretty quickly. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. And again, we're still talking about John the Baptist. 
Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <clears throat> this is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who has surpassed me because he existed before me. I don't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. I don't understand that, that statement. He did know him, but yet he says, I, I didn't know him. And John testified, I watched the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. The one who sent me to baptize with water told me to look for this. Well, who was that? What was the Holy Spirit speaking to him? So this is one of those times where, you know, the Holy Spirit does, does appear in acts in full power and to, to a mass of people. But we see all through the Old Testament and the New Testament where the Holy Spirit has been talking to people. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's been pre, pre, uh, pre-incarnate visits from Jesus. Sometimes it's been, it's been visions, it's been dreams. He still talks to us, by the way, through visions and dreams, things like that. So, so John is talking about how I remember that day that Jesus came, and I didn't know him, but I did know him. I didn't know him, but I did know him, but then the one who sent me, said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to point this person out. Um, of all the baptisms, John, you're going to do, there's going to be one that's going to stand out to you. That's going to be the one where the presence of God descends and rests on that person. Let's look at that in Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 13 through 17. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Again, but he didn't know who he was. He knew who he was. He knew who he was enough to say, I really need to be baptized by you. And, but remember, Jesus said, no, we need to do it this way, John. Work with me here, cuz. Um, I don't, Sally and I were talking about what kind of relationship did, <laughs> did they have? Did they never see each other again? Uh, I, I don't know. But I know that John, when given the opportunity to baptize the Messiah, was a little hesitant. He was like, you know, I really feel awkward doing this. Have you ever had that kind of situation where you've been called on to do something that you just felt like, but guess what? Go ahead and do it because of who you are in Christ. You, you, get to, you get to jump the line. You get, to, you get the privilege of jumping the line. When, uh, as I've taught my children, there's no sense in having clout if you're not going to use it. That's, that's a free, free little lesson right there. All right, so Jesus answered him, Allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him to be baptized. After Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And there, and there came a voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son. I take delight in him. John the Baptist knew Jesus well enough to know he wasn't worthy to baptize him, but that didn't stop him because Jesus said, we, this is the way we're going to do it, and they did it. And then he saw what he saw, and just imagine that scene. That's, that's a pretty cool scene. Even with all that, he still wanted to keep Jesus the center stage. He, see, he could, I would have put that on my business card. I would have put that on my resume somewhere, a picture with me and Jesus and the dove coming down. It's like, this was me, you know? John was like, no, no, Photoshop me completely out of that picture. The only thing in the picture should be Jesus and that dove. I mean, that's, that's your picture right there. How many of y'all saw Peter's picture of him and Josh, the Vanderbilt basketball player? Um, for those of you who don't know, Peter is not the tallest person in our church, um, but, he's, but he's a nice guy, and apparently Josh is like seven foot four. <laughs> And so he's got his hand like this, and Peter's like standing there. And Peter, Peter put down there at the bottom, this is not Photoshopped. 
Okay? If I were photoshopping this, it's very different. John wanted, even in this, he wanted to point to the Messiah. This is my beloved son. I take it in him. That was the important thing. Um, what I love about what John did here was he made... Um, he, he knew that he was a major character in the story of his life, but he knew he wasn't the main character in the story of his life. You are a major character in the story of your life, but as a Christian, you're not the main character in the story of your life. You are a major character, but you're not the main character. Jesus is the main character in our life. And that's exciting. That's what we want. We want to be that. So let me finish today with, with this one scripture, and then we'll, we'll uh, be dismissed. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Christian, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled on by men. Christian, you're the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. When we set out to exalt ourself, we're putting ourselves in that main character. But when we set to put Christ and set him up, the beauty is that he illuminates us. Just because of, just because of his light, we shine brighter. You know, it's, it's just the kind of the way it is. It, it's, it's like many of us have figured out you can't outgive God. Now, I'm not one of those that says, give more so God will give you more. But I do believe if you give more, God gives you more because that's just the way he does things. This week, I, uh, I got to uh, go through some training, and um, I love one of the stories that was told. Um, and I, I just want to share this in closing. Um, the guy who was doing the training is an old, uh, old principal. And uh, great, very smart guy. He's from Texas. I didn't hold that against him. He's from Texas. And, um, but, but he was talking about one day he was calling up sub substitute teachers. You know, He was calling up people to substitute for the day. And he said this is back in the day where there weren't cell phones. You know, it was just a big clunky phone. Most of us actually maybe, does anybody still have a phone at home? Because we might want to do a history lesson on that someday and just come over there. But, but so he said he called, and he called Susie, whatever her name is, and, and the husband picked up the phone, Hello, good morning, and he said, it was a small town, he knew who I was, I knew who he was, he knew why I was calling. Hey, is Susie there? Let me get her. And he lays the phone down. And so he hears the thunk, 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 you know, who is it? I think it's the principal over at the school, he probably wants you to substitute. Oh, no. And he said, I heard that, and I, I immediately thought, well, I ought to just hang up. Well, well, I just, I'm just, when she gets back on the line, I'm going to say, well, look, if you don't want to substitute at my school, then I'm just going to take you off the list. Well, I just need to, I've, he said, you know, he is a Christian, so eventually that kicked in. And um, <laughs> she comes to the phone, she goes, hello? He goes, yeah, uh, Susie, this is so-and-so, and this is Mark, and I was just wanting to see if you wanted to substitute teach today, thinking she's going to go, no. She goes, oh, no, I just accepted a job from the other school like five minutes ago. Can I, can I call and cancel that? Because I'd really rather come to your school. And he's like, well, sure, honey, that's fine. We see people's behavior, but we may not see their thinking. Jesus, Jesus is more, more interested in what? Our belief than our behavior. Our attitude over our action. A lot of times, all we get to see in other people is their action and their behavior. Don't immediately assume the worst. Love on them. 
Because we're carrying around these beautiful flashlights doesn't mean that the flashlight is to be used as a blunt instrument against the forehead of people who aren't doing what we want them to do. You and I cannot change somebody's action, but God can change their attitude. We can't change their behavior, but God can change their belief. And then from the inside out, it gets corrected. It gets corrected in the Holy Spirit's time. It gets corrected in the Holy Spirit's order. I think if I put together a list of five things that are wrong with, with a person, and I said, okay, which of these five things would you address first? I bet you we'd have at least 20 different answers to, well, this ought to be first, this ought to be second, this ought to be third. But see, the good news is we don't have to figure that out. That's, that, the Holy Spirit is in charge of that. All we're in charge of is going, behold, the Lamb of God. Behold, there's the one who's coming. That he, He's got the answer. Well, don't you have the answer? No. Only thing I've got is on loan from him. So let's just go straight to him. Because we want to go straight to him. Uh, I want to. I want to end this one. I do want to give you guys an update about what's going on in my world. Um, for those of you who who don't know, I am bivocational, and this church takes really good care of me, and I love the the, the generosity of this church. I've always done something extra, um, and so up until a couple of weeks ago, I was doing woodworking, and and I made that cross, and I do stuff like that. And, um, and the, the, the business that I was working for moved up to Kentucky, so it was a lot farther for me to go. And quite honestly, it got to where it was just killing my hands. Doing the same, you know, motion for eight to ten hours, two days a week was just tearing my hands up. And uh, so I went to the guy, and it's like, Perry, man, I love you, but I'm not doing this anymore. And so um, I... A few days later, I just felt led to, to contact the school that Joseph graduated from, Christian Community, and um, I, I knew that they had lost one of their main teachers, had gone to Maryland to, to teach, uh, to, to ministry, and so I, uh, my friend Steve Gillespie is the, is the principal there, headmaster, and I said, Steve, you know, I just, if, if you've got something that you need my help on or whatever, um, so he's like, I just got an email from a guy, from a lady who said she can't fulfill her contract could we talk about you teaching next year? And so I went and I met with them. Uh, I had a great conversation with them. I sent out texts to, to Steve and to Dave and said, hey, pray with Sally and I as we pray about this. And we all came to the same conclusion that this was, this was a good thing. Um, so I actually am going to be teaching um, history, um, several history classes and Bible class um, there at CCS starting in about two weeks. And I'm really excited about it, um, but let me assure you, thank you, I've already seen God, because um, Dave was, Dave's inclination from the Lord was, I think God is going to use this to teach you something you need to learn to be, you know, for whatever he's got for you next, and I've already seen the area that, that God is beginning to deal with me on that, you know, just, just some cool stuff. Um, but let me assure you, this is my priority. You are my priority. You can text me. You can call me. Um, if you don't have my cell phone in your phone, you need to have my cell phone because you can call me or text me. I'm one of five men on staff, and I'm one of two. I'm one of three pastors. So they understand having pastors as staff people, and they understand my priority is, is you guys. And, uh, well, thank you. And um, so if you don't have that, uh, but I'm excited. Um, for those of you who know, Sally's, Sally's much more qualified to teach than I am. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And it's history. I mean, it's not like math or English where I'd have to actually <laughs> do something. <laughs> hmm? CCS is in White House. It's right off the interstate. And so, yeah, it, it's like five minutes from my house instead of... 35 minutes. So thank you. Keep praying with me about that. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, the conference this week. So let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this group of people and the opportunity you've given me to be their pastor. And uh, God, you continue to develop in me the skills and abilities that this group needs and that you need for me to have in, uh, in being salt and light to our community and to our world. And God, uh, we really, um, there are some situations that 
humanly speaking, they look, they look pretty, pretty tough, um, pretty hard to deal with. But God, you don't look at things humanly speaking. You look at things divinely speaking. You are supernatural. And God, we want to be supernatural. Uh, we want to see things happen um, according to your time, according to your glory, according to your provision, uh, according to your power and strength, which uh, is quite a bit higher than our ability. So we thank you in advance for, for what you're going to be doing. And, uh, and God, I just thank you again for each person here, and I pray a special blessing on them that as they go this week, they will feel more energized than they ever have before. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed to fellowship.